and I'm, I'm, I don't mean to steal anybody's thunder, but just really, it's we got to act quickly. Okay, so let us get started. Um, I'm very, very pleased that Dimitri Lascaris, who is uh, one of the two sponsors of the resolution, he is in the shadow cabinet of the Green Party. He is uh, the justice uh, critic. He was appointed to that in the spring with great fanfare by the Green Party, which is wonderful. And I'm, I'm glad that he is holding the Green Party to the standard of justice. Uh, so as Robert indicated, I am the uh, justice critic in the shadow cabinet of the Green Party. I've had that position for six months. It's been quite six months. Um, I never imagined that we would find ourselves where we currently find ourselves today. Uh, when I accepted Elizabeth May's invitation to be a, mem to be a member of Shadow Cabinet, uh, it was not in my contemplation that any of this would happen. Um, and really what was the driving force for me to bring forward this resolution? I mean, I was always, uh, not always, but certainly for quite some time, I've been quite uh, concerned about the plight of the Palestinian people. And in uh, April and May of this year, uh, at which time I was a practicing class actions lawyer, not anymore, I had to travel to Israel in order to uh, interview Eritrean refugees in connection with the human rights class action being pursued against the Canadian gold mining company, which is accused of having used forced labor in Eritrea. As it happens, many of these refugees uh, fled one of the world's most repressive regimes through Ethiopia and then the Sudan, and they came up through the Negev into Israel. And uh, that's what took me to Israel. Um, and before I left in March of this year, um, I saw an interview with, uh, of Gideon Levy, one of, uh, uh, a truly wonderful journalist uh, who writes, as many as you know, for Haaretz, and uh, the interviewer was Max Blumenthal, and it was on Real News. By the way, I'm a board member of the Real News Network. It's a wonderful news organization. I strongly urge you all to watch it as much as possible. Uh, in any event, in this interview, Max Blumenthal, as you can see up here, he asked Gideon Levy about some statements that Gideon Levy had made about Hebron, the largest uh, city in the West Bank. And what, uh, what uh, Gideon Levy explained to Max Blumenthal is that uh, if you really want to see Israeli apartheid, you must go to Hebron. And you, there you will see it all its vivid colors. It's virtually undeniable. And that made a big impression on me. So when I was in Israel in April and May after completing my interviews of uh, Eritrean refugees, I uh, traveled to East Jerusalem and then into the West Bank and eventually to Hebron. And I'd like to show you all a little bit of what I saw because people have asked me repeatedly, why did you do this? What motivated you to do this? Uh, and I don't think that anything motivated me more than what I saw with my own eyes, which made a, really had quite a, a devastating impact on me. So the first thing that I did was I went to uh, Bethlehem uh, after interviewing these Eritrean refugees. And the reason why I did that is, why I started there, is because uh, several months earlier I had, uh, I had agreed to act on behalf of a Palestinian Canadian whose name is Rihad Nazal. Uh, who was from Bethlehem. The reason why I agreed to act for her, for her and I did that on a pro bono basis uh, as a matter of conscience, is because she was shot in Bethlehem, in the lake, by an Israeli sniper, uh, I think it was late last year, while she was filming uh, Israeli skunk trucks uh, pouring noxious fluid on the homes of Palestinians. Not on violent protesters, but on the homes of Palestinians. And uh, you'll see in this photograph, uh, the wall from which she was shot, you'll see a little orange window uh, right in that wall. And that opened up as she was filming and she took a bullet in the leg. And, uh, and uh, regrettably, but all too predictably, the Canadian government has not done nothing, even though she's a Canadian citizen, to vindicate her rights. So my, my mandate is to try to get some measure of justice for rehab. But I went there and I met her. And uh, she walked me through this, the, the city of Bethlehem and it showed me uh, what she thought was most pertinent for my understanding of the plight of the Palestinian people there. And the first thing she did was she took me into a building which was supposed to be a large commercial uh, center and it's basically wasting away. The structure has been erected, but it can't be 
completed because the Israeli forces, as she explained to me, basically use it to pour uh, tear gas down on people. And uh, this is the building, and you, as you can see, you look out, it's not complete, it's just a shell. And uh, as we walked through that building, we found these uh, the evidence of tear gas and other noxious devices that are used to suppress peaceful protest in Bethlehem. They were all over the place, and I just put them up on, the, on a few of them. There were literally hundreds of them, they were everywhere. They were down in the street as well, and they contaminate the environment. Um, but this will give you an example, a sample of what, what I saw there. And as I was, I, was, I was gathering these up, and she was explaining to me uh, what was going on, what, what these devices were all about, and what is done from this building to the Palestinian residents of Bethlehem, we heard some uh, playful noises outside the building, and uh, I looked over the wall, and, um, sorry, this doesn't seem to be working now, and I saw these children, and they gathered into the street, I'd never seen them before, and they looked up and they gave us the sign, signs of peace, and that uh, was really quite a moving thing. And that image has stayed with me ever since. We then went on the edge of uh, this, the town of Bethlehem, and she took me to see the expansion of the separation wall. I had thought uh, naively that the wall was done, and it's static, but it's not. It's in a state of expansion. And she introduced me to a Palestinian farmer uh, who has an orchard that is now on the wrong side of the expanding separation wall. It's been in his family for generations. And uh, this is the gentleman, and you can see that the wall, that the greenery behind this gentleman uh, is his orchard. What remains of it, some of it has been bulldozed uh, to make a foundation for the wall. And you can see the wall coming down behind him and surrounding his orchard. And what he said to us, he didn't speak English, but uh, Rehab translated for me was, that they are breaking my connection to the land. Mm -hmm. And I, as a member of the Green Party, I must say, am particularly sensitive to that, uh, that sentiment. Uh, we then traveled to Hebron and saw uh, firsthand what Gideon Levy had advised us to see. And uh, in Hebron, they're in a commercial center, which used to be a thriving and bustling commercial center, uh, that has now been ethnically cleansed of, largely ethnically cleansed of Palestinians. Uh, there are some there, some brave souls, uh, people perhaps who have no other options, and they're trapped there, but it essentially is now a, 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 an enclave for, as Gideon Levy describes them, the most fanatical uh, members of the Southern community. And, and Gideon said in that quote that I, I put up earlier, you know, some of these people are so fanatical that really what they deserve is psychiatric treatment. That's what they really need. Uh, these are people who really, uh, I think, have been in many ways indoctrinated to an extraordinary degree and don't, and they've lost their sense of humanity. Yeah. And you see this, the evidence of this as you walk through the ethnically cleansed enclave of the commercial center of Hebron. Uh, this is a wall which now separates the people of Hebron from the commercial center. And uh, this is a heavily armed uh, checkpoint through which uh, Palestinians may not pass. Uh, I was able to go through it because I have a Canadian passport. Uh, with some difficulty, Rehab was able to accompany me only because she had her Canadian passport. And even though we cleared the checkpoint, we were confronted by heavily armed soldiers about 10 or 15 meters beyond the checkpoint, and, uh, and they began to interrogate us, and uh, Rehab said, She's an extraordinary woman of extraordinary courage. And she said, and why, what, what right do you have to question us? We cleared the checkpoint. And she persisted. They didn't want to answer. And eventually one of them said, right there in front of me, only Jews can walk here. So people are precluded from walking in what was a bustling commercial center of the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank because of their ethnicity. And he was quite candid about that. We also walked through the, uh, one of the old city of Hebron, uh, which is on the other side of the wall that I just showed to you. And it was explained to us by some of the Palestinian merchants there. And by the way, it was, a, it was absolutely dead. There was no tourist traffic whatsoever. And I was just amazed at how these people managed to keep their businesses afloat. Uh, and they showed, and they, they pointed overhead, and we saw a net over the cobbled streets of the of old city of Hebron. And there was a garbage pile on top of the net. You can see it here. And it was explained to us that uh, this is garbage which is thrown down on the heads of the Palestinian merchants by the settlers who live above. And uh, it was also explained to us that because 
the net was protecting them. They had resorted the settlers to pouring filthy water down on the heads of the, uh, the Palestinian merchants. In the commercial center, we also saw this, which uh, we understood to be a home of one of the few Palestinians who's left. And you'll see that somebody that scrawled uh, the Star of David on their door. And this was perhaps the most disturbing thing I saw in Hebron. It was a poster. It was everywhere. And you'll see it says, Free Ettinger. Who is Ettinger? Mayor Ettinger is a settler from the West Bank who was accused by the Israeli government, not by the Palestinians, but by the Israeli government, of having firebombed the home of a Palestinian family and burned to death an 18-month-old Palestinian baby and his parents. And the sole survivor is the four-year-old brother of that baby. In the center of Hebron, the settlers believe this man to be a hero. They believe that he should be freed and not held accountable for his crimes. None of this will appear in the mainstream media in Canada, of course. This is the degree to which the, the settlers in that community have lost all sense of reason and humanity. To be perfectly blunt about it. So when I came back from this trip, I was determined, uh, bluntly as a matter of conscience, to bring forward this resolution. Uh, I, I have to tell you all I was skeptical that it would pass, uh, because it was very clear to me from the outset that Elizabeth May, for whom I have a great deal of respect, was not prepared to support the resolution. I didn't think, in light of her uh, discomfort with the resolution, that we could persuade the members of the party to support the resolution. Um, and I'll explain to you how this all unfolded in a moment, but first I'd like to show you the resolution itself. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of very key features, which I'll come back to in a moment, about this resolution. The first thing about this resolution, if you look at the first year resolve clause at the very top, the sanctions that we have resolved to support, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, are limited to those sectors of Israel economy and society which profit from the ongoing occupation of the occupied Palestinian territories. Our resolution is not anti-Israel. Our resolution is anti-occupation. It's not a complaint that we, we are not raising a complaint with the existence of the state of Israel. We are raising a complaint, a direct complaint with the occupation. A brutal occupation that Noam Chomsky describes as much worse than apartheid in South Africa. That's how bad it is. Okay, the second thing I want to draw to your attention about this resolution, if you look at the second clause, it says, we will support that form of DDS, the one referred to in the first clause, until such time as Israel implements a permanent ban on further settlement construction in the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories and enters into good faith negotiations with representatives of the Palestinian people for the purpose of establishing a viable, contiguous, and truly sovereign Palestinian state. I'm going to explain to you later, later why that is a very, very modest demand. There's nothing divisive or extremist about it, but I'll come back to that. Now, this resolution was submitted uh, by me, along with 32 members of the Green Party under our party rules, at least 20 members of the party in good standing must sponsor a resolution. We got 32. Actually, a number of other people signed on, but they didn't do it before the deadline for submission of the resolution. We would have had close to 40. The 32 members of the party who sponsored the resolution include three current members of Shadow Cabinet, not just me, but two others. And there were also two other members of Shadow Cabinet who didn't sponsor, but who spoke eloquently in favor of the resolution at the convention, Paul Manley and Lisa Barrett. It was supported, sponsored also by a former executive director of the party who is currently the GPC's international liaison, Johan Hamel, from Belgium, and over 10 former candidates of the Green Party. As I said, it was submitted in the first half of 2016. In order for a policy in our party to be adopted, the resolution has to undergo three steps of review. The first step is an online vote that is held prior to the convention. All persons who have been members of the party for at least 30 days prior to the vote are eligible to participate in that vote. Uh, and the online vote for policy resolutions was completed in June of this year. And you can see the results in the following slide. 58.5% voted green. In other words, they approved of the resolution in its form as submitted. Only 13.3% were opposed. The ratio of Supporters to opponents was in excess of four to one. 
And then there was another category, 28.2%, who voted yellow. What does yellow mean? Um, yellow means that people, uh, you know, you'll see in this, this slide, there's, there's an explanation of our bylaws. Our bylaws say if, if, uh, if, a, if a resolution goes to convention, it can only be changed in ways that are consistent with the original intent of the motion. So when people vote yellow, what they're saying is, I want this to go to workshop. I like the original intent, but I, I hope that this can be improved, and I'd like there to be a discussion about whether it can be improved. So what that really means is that in excess of 86% of the people who participated in that vote were comfortable, if not outright supported, by the original intent of the motion. And only 13.3% were opposed. Now it's true, I've heard a criticism, uh, one of the criticisms I've heard since the convention is that less than a majority, much less than a majority of all the people who were members of the party voted in that online vote. The number was close to 2,000 people, and I believe we have something like 20,000 members. But that's true of all of our resolutions. There's nothing peculiar about that. And I don't hear people wailing and gnashing their teeth about these other resolutions that only had, you know, 20% of the eligible voters participate in the vote. This one, however, has attracted uh, particular ire from some segments of the Green Party, unfortunately, and also in particular from people outside of our party. So, after, uh, one other thing I need to tell you about the party's rules is that uh, if you get less than 60% in the online vote, but more than 50%, typically what happens is this resolution will go to workshop at the convention, uh, which is basically a room which is more or less as big as this room, and whoever wants to come and fit in a room and who's eligible, uh, who's a member of the party, uh, they can participate in that workshop, and at the end of it, there's a discussion about whether to modify it, and at the end of that, uh, if there's no consensus, there's a vote. So uh, this went to workshop, and uh, the workshop at that workshop, somebody who was a member of Shadow Cabinet proposed an alternative, uh, which, from my perspective, was really a massive watering down of the resolution. And we raised a point of order and said, "This is not consistent with the original intent of the resolution." Uh, and as I just indicated, it has to be consistent with the original intent in order for the amendment to pass. And the facilitator of the workshop ruled in our favor, rejected the alternative, and then this matter went to a vote. And the level of support of the workshop, and, and Elizabeth May was there, John Luke Cook, who proposed the alternative resolution, a member of Shadow Cabinet, was also there. They argued their position. The level of support in the workshop was so uh, substantial that no one could call for a hand count. And there was a really party round of applause, as a matter of fact, at the end of the, the vote. Um, we then uh, took the resolution to the plenary floor, floor on the following day. A vote was held. Uh, all GPC members who were physically present at the plenary were eligible to vote. And uh, the, again, after a very extensive debate, I, I think it's fair to say that this resolution received at least as much debate, if not more so, than any other resolution that was on the convention floor. Uh, the margin of victory was so large in that plenary that uh, no one requested a hand count. That everybody, even the most fearsome opponents of the resolution, could see that there was so much support for the resolution that they didn't even bother asking for a hand count. Now, you can imagine many of you, what happened after this resolution passed. And I have to say, I and many others were quite surprised. Uh, and I, I can't take credit for this victory. There were wonderful people from Independent Jewish Voices, Corey Levine, Diane Ralph, who spoke. Paul Manley spoke. Lisa Barrett spoke. Uh, a gentleman over here, Ali Khan, he also spoke very passionately for the resolution. And, uh, and, and the totality of the arguments that were put forward ultimately swayed the grassroots of the party, uh, in, my, in, my, in my view. I think that's crystal clear. And predictably, what happened from the moment, from the very moment that this resolution passed, is the pro-Israel groups, apologists for the fascist Benjamin Netanyahu, and the mainstream media in this country, who shamelessly pandered to the apologists for Benjamin Netanyahu, began to attack our party. and. The dominant theme of those groups and the mainstream media was, number one, we are anti-Semites, which is scurrilously false. Uh, you know, to accuse people like Diana Ralph, Ralph who just feels very strongly about her 
uh, her Jewish culture and her heritage, or Leah Tarachansky, standing right over there, being anti-Semites, it's an obscenity. Uh, but there's no respect for the truth amongst those persons who are acting as apologists for Benjamin Netanyahu. And uh, you'll see here up on the screen an example of the kinds of attacks we had to endure. The Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, on the very day that we adopted the resolution, it was as though they had something ready just in case the resolution was adopted, we condemn the Green Party's decision to endorse this outrageous resolution, the BDS movement which seeks to censor and blacklist Israelis, that is patently false, is fundamentally discriminatory, that is patently false, and utterly at odds with Canadian values, that is patently false. There is nothing but false in the next statement. The B'nai B'rith, which audaciously claims to be a human rights organization, said on the same day, within hours of our having adopted this resolution, with the Green Party's support for unfairly singling out the world's only Jewish state for contempt, it has firmly entrenched itself beyond the fringe of mainstream Canadian politics. Greens have, this is the CEO Michael Moss, Greens have chosen to embrace the following position of shills for 9-11 conspiracy theorists and terror apologists rather than side with a democratic and environmentally friendly state of Israel. As though, uh, assuming that the government of Israel is environmentally friendly, a highly dubious proposition, does that mean we're to turn a blind eye to egregious human rights violations? Is that the argument of the B'nai B'rith, the human rights organization? And, the, and Mr. Mossy goes on and says, this clearly reflects how out of touch the Green Party has become with Canadian culture and values and has made itself less relevant after its convention this weekend by voting for the politics of division and demonization. A very ironic statement, because the demonization has been flowing from the apologists for the Netanyahu government towards those who supported this resolution. And then there was the predictable uh, mainstream media bias. And I'm giving you a little sample here of the headlines that emerged. Blood and Mail on the 7th, vote to support Israel boycott campaign divides Green Party. There's no discussion about whether this is actually the right thing to do. It's all about the divisions in our party. Again, August 8th, National Post, Green Party's boycott is real policy, totally unhelpful to peace. Ambassador to Canada said. Did anybody in that article speak, did the author of that article speak to the Palestinian people to see how they felt about this? No. Because their voices don't matter. National Post, August 10. Green Party losing members, riding associations as BDS controversy highlights infighting. Toronto Star, really quite disappointing. This is supposed to be the great progressive newspaper. Rather than fleeing the scene of its political car crash over policy on Israel, Elizabeth May should stick around and save her party from itself. This is what passes for a progressive newspaper in Canada nowadays. Hamilton Spectator, the Green's big mistake in Elizabeth May. However, there are other voices out there which the political elite don't want you to know about. Tyler Levitan of Independent Jewish Voices said, this is the first time a Canadian political party with representation in the House of Commons has taken a strong and positive position in solidarity with the grassroots Palestinian movement for freedom, justice, and equality. Tom Woodley of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. By voting overwhelmingly in support of this EDS resolution, Green Party members demonstrate their deep concern for the human rights of Indigenous Palestinians. I challenge you to find an article in the Trump Star, the National Post, the Globe and Mail, which quotes these voices. You'll find none. And then Andrew Mitrovich, who is a treasure, a little-known treasure, I think, in our journalistic community in this country, writing in Al Jazeera, because, of course, getting this kind of article published in the mainstream media is quite difficult. And what Mr. Mitrovich had said, and I commend his article to you, all of you, the resolution is concrete testament to the will and determination of the majority of Green Party members who have taken a laudable stand in the defense of rights and dignity of besieged Palestinians. Like you and me, Palestinians exist in flesh and blood with families, hopes, and dreams. The BDS movement is one palpable way for more Canadians not only to express their solidarity, but to declare unmistakably that Palestinian lives matter. We are not alone. The Green Parties of the United States and the United Kingdom have already taken the lead in this matter. We are following them. Now, if you can do this in the United States and the UK, where the hostility toward the BDS movement is no less than it is here, why can you not do this in Canada? 
Why are the challenges confronting Jill Stein and her explicit endorsement, even on CNN a few weeks ago, of the BDS movement any less than those confronting our party? There are no less. And there's no evidence, none whatsoever, that the US Green Party or the UK Green Party are at risk of disintegration because of their support for BDS. Absolutely not. I challenge anybody to show me that evidence. If anything, support for those parties is growing. We can do this. They did it, and we can do it as well. Now, having said all of that, does our resolution actually amount to an endorsement of the BDS movement? People have said, within the party establishment, we shouldn't be endorsing a social movement that is beyond our control. Now, I understand there's a patent of legitimacy to this argument, except that it ignores that in last year our party endorsed the Leap Manifesto. And if you talk to Naomi Klein, uh, who was at the World Social Forum, and I had the opportunity to talk to her, she'll tell you that the Leap Manifesto is essentially a declaration of values of the social movement. It's not a partisan political document. It's not the constitutional political party, it's a social movement. So why is it acceptable for us to endorse the Leap Manifesto? which is beyond our control, but it's utterly unacceptable for us to endorse the BDS movement. No one has offered a remotely plausible explanation or answer to that question. But as it happens, we aren't endorsing the BDS movement. And how do I know this? Because I drafted this resolution, and I did it expressly in a narrow way to avoid that argument. I made this as minimalist as possible, I will tell you, quite candidly, in order to maximize the chances that our party's members would ultimately adopt it. And how did I do that? The BDS movement has three objectives. You can go to their set website and check this out for yourself. Number one, ending the occupation and the colonization of all Arab lands, which means Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. Number two, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. And number three, protecting and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. As, I, as you can see up on this, this uh, on the screen, I wholeheartedly embrace all of those objectives. I think they're fine objectives. I have no argument with any of them. But the BDS resolution does not embrace these objectives. The BDS resolution says nothing about the right of return. The BDS resolution says nothing about the end of the occupation of the Golan Heights. That's Syrian territory. It says nothing about that. The BDS resolution says nothing about ensuring equal rights for Arab Palestinians who live in Israel. Nothing at all. It talks about one thing, the one thing that ought to be a slam dunk for us all, the one thing that is actually reflected in Canadian government policy, even under Stephen Harper. The settlements are a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and they must cease. And until they do cease, they are an obstacle to peace. You can go to the Canadian government website. You can see this for yourself. That is all our resolution talks about. And it says expressly that when those settlements are permanently halted, the construction of them, and the Israeli government enters into good faith negotiations with the Palestinian people for purposes of creating a viable sovereign state, then we will revisit or end altogether our support for BDS. I mean, we don't even go to the point of saying that the Palestinian people actually have to have a state in order for us to end our support for BDS. We only say we'll stop it when you start good faith negotiations and have implemented a permanent ban on settlement construction. So, there, anybody who looks honestly at this resolution and even has a passing familiarity with the objectives and the scope of the BDS movement would know very well that we are not endorsing the movement. This is a limited endorsement of the tactic of BDS for a limited purpose. How else is our resolution different from the BDS movement? The, the, the resolution, the BDS movement I should say, if you look at the second bullet in this slide, it says the BDS movement calls for a boycott to be applied to Israeli and international companies that are involved in violation of Palestinian human rights, as well as complicit Israeli sporting, cultural, and academic institutions. We do not go so far. 
because it is not only the human rights of Palestinians in the occupied territories that are being violated, it's also the, Palestinian, the rights of Palestinians in Israel itself and in the refugee camps that are being violated. We don't call for sanctions, boycott, and divestment to be applied to those who are violating the rights of Palestinians in Israel or violating the rights of Palestinians in refugee camps. We only talk about the settlements. That's it. And the settlements are in the West Bank. We've left that question untouched. And so at the end of the day, if someone came up to me and said, you know what, Lascaris, your resolution is not nearly bold enough. It should go much further. I mean, really, this is not adequate. You know, I would, I would have a difficult time responding to that critique. But to say that this resolution is too aggressive, that it goes too far, is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. It is a minimalist resolution, and it is one that we, as members of the Green Party, should have absolutely no problem embracing. None at all. It is consonant with Canadian government policy, even under Stephen Harper. Despite all of that, we now have to deal with the possibility that this resolution will be gutted or rescinded altogether. Uh, the voices that I told you about earlier from the mainstream media and from the apologists for Netanyahu uh, have had some effect on our party. Yeah, it's not uh, entirely surprising that's the case. And so the federal council of our party has called for a meeting in early December in Calgary for the purpose of, amongst other things, revisiting this resolution. And I uh, have agreed to be perfectly candid, to participate in good faith negotiations with a view to trying to achieve a consensus. Because although I have no doubt in my mind about the rightness of this cause, I'm also mindful of the fact, as I know Constantine is, and other members of the Green Party who support this resolution, uh, of the effect it is having on the party. But there are certain principles that we cannot compromise. So we're going to participate in those discussions, and hopefully they will be fruitful, but at the end of the day, they may not result in a consensus, in which case uh, there would potentially be a vote in Calgary on a resolution which seeks to uh, gut this resolution, moderate this resolution, or rescind it altogether. Now, there's a way that you and any member of the Canadian public, whether a member of the Green Party or not, can help us to preserve this important victory for human rights. And that is, if you're not a member, become a member, as Robert said. And if you are a member, make your voice heard, whether by voting or otherwise. Now, I want to be absolutely crystal clear about this. I am not asking people who are only concerned about Palestinian human rights to become members of the Green Party. If, you're, if that's your sole cause, uh, you know, there are many ways that you can uh, achieve your objectives outside of the Green Party, and I, I strongly urge you to do that, whether it's by supporting the EDS movement, another Palestinian solidarity organization. But if you happen to have values which are consonant with those of the Green Party, and you want to defend this victory, then you should become a member of our party. By all means, you need to get involved and get involved now. What are our values? Our values are fundamentally progressive values. Our values are ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, sustainability, and respect for diversity. If you recognize those values, they lie in your heart, then this is the party for you, and now is the time for you to become a member and to help us to preserve this victory for human rights. What are some policies that we have adopted, which are expressions of those values. We oppose the democracy-destroying trade agreements, like the TPP and the CETA, an absolute abomination to our democracy. We oppose tar sands pipelines. We're the only party with representation in Parliament that is unequivocally opposed to tar sands pipelines. The so-called so progressive Justin Trudeau wants to see the energy east built, even though the climate crisis represents an existential threat to our children. We want a guaranteed livable income for all Canadians. We want post-secondary education to be tuition-free. We were the only national party that opposed the disastrous bombardment of Libya, which has now created another failed state in the Arab and Muslim world, which has exacerbated an unprecedented refugee crisis, and which has given a home, another home, to the terrorists of ISIS. 
Only we oppose the bombardment of Libya. This is a party which I suspect embraces many of the policies, if not all of the policies that people in this room would embrace. And if you feel at home in this party, I urge you to join it and help us to preserve this victory. Now, how do you do that? Uh, it's very simple. If you are so minded, you can go to the Green Party's website and you click on a link for becoming a member. It's not sufficient to contribute. You actually have to select becoming a member. Uh, you can become a member for one year with a $10 contribution. Of course, we encourage those who are interested in becoming members to contribute more than that if they're able. Um, you'll be eligible to vote uh, at the Calgary meeting or at the ratification vote that is supposed to occur after the Calgary meeting if you've been a member of the party for 30 days at least. And you can see there in, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, screen the, the link. And uh, if, you know, I don't expect all of you to write it down, but if you have any questions about this, I'm sure you can all figure it out. If you're so minded, become a member of the party, you can just email me at dimitri.lascaris at greenparty.ca. At the end of the day, whatever you do, whether or not you become a member of the party, I ask you to remember these children. Because ultimately, this is as simple as these children. That's why this is the right thing to do. Thank you. Then, communities all over the world must take action quickly. Another point about media bias. The previous Canadian government said that the Palestinians had preconditions to peace talks. Well, that precondition was an end to the land grabs. The definition of an armistice is ending hostilities and entering into good faith negotiations. So how is it that ending the hostility of land grabs and human rights violations can be considered a precondition to peace? John Baird went and said this on behalf of the Canadian government, but it was actually Benjamin Netanyahu and his government that had the precondition to peace, peace talks. That precondition to peace talks was that the land grabs and illegal settlement expansions can continue while the peace talks, so-called peace talks, were ongoing. Now I'd like to get into the principles, or, or rather the values Nonviolence. We need an increased focus on diplomacy and less on violence, reduction in military expenditures and invasions. This includes better training and psychological screening for police forces. We have seen what happens when the principle of nonviolence is violated. When might makes right in international affairs, Operation Iraqi Freedom, an illegal, immoral war based on lies and deceit, deceit which are the weapons of mass distraction. A war that only succeeded in losing a million lives and a trillion dollars just to turn the region into the deadly war-ravaged area it is today, complete with millions of refugees, many drowning in the sea, running for their lives. All of this is a function of failed international policies. This is a war that the Christian government said Canada will not participate in, but actually had Canadian troops fighting and being wounded in. Politics as usual cannot even be trusted to tell Canadians when we are at war. That is why we need a Green Party in Parliament. On participatory democracy, we need governance transparency, not closed door negotiations for huge decisions that impact on all of us, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership and NAFTA. And regarding NAFTA, I authored and put through as ratified policy that we should renegotiate NAFTA or get out of it. There are too many ways we can be sued just because we're trying to protect our citizens. We need electoral reform, ending a corrupt electoral system gained for decades where a party can get 100% control of the House of Commons, even though most people voted against them. I will be introducing policy resolutions to the GPC, suggesting ending the current political system 
of donations that benefits the wealthy with tax subsidies and replacing it with a system where each citizen can assign a specific amount to political parties and campaigns. We need fairness for citizens of all incomes in funding the political process and eliminating corporate political donations in Canada. <laughs> On sustainability and ecological wisdom, respect for diversity, the three concepts are intrinsically linked. We cannot grow populations forever. All species are to be valued and respected. Space must be reserved for other species as opposed to the corporate profit model of infinite land grabs and ongoing large-scale extinction of species. These values mean saying no to the likes of Monsanto and their GMO-based pesticide monoculture, saying no to oil pipelines and their ecological devastation. These values mean saying no to cancer-causing pollution in our air, our water, and saying no to disease-causing trans fats and growth hormones in our food. These values mean saying yes to First Nations and understanding the concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement. <laughs> Respect for diversity includes not only life found in the biosphere, but in all of our people. Respecting our differences. All these values mean preventing a runaway greenhouse effect on the earth where heat is trapped in a negative feedback loop. We are at that verge. I am introducing a policy idea to stop the runaway greenhouse effect. I call it the Green Marshall Plan. And it is also a Facebook group. You are welcome to join. We are at the verge of a runaway greenhouse effect that threatens to turn our world into Dante's Inferno while corporations pay vast sums of money to deny it. We have seen cities annihilated with Hurricane Katrina. We have seen tens of thousands die in heat waves in France and roads melting in India with over 50 degrees Celsius temperatures. Here in Toronto, freak ice storms knock out power for days at a time. We are at that tipping point of a runaway greenhouse effect. We need large-scale action, and we need it now. In the 2008 financial crisis, we heard the term too big to fail. Does anyone remember the term too big to fail for corporations and banksters? Many of you, I'm sure, do. My point is that if banksters are too big to fail, if corporations are too big to fail, then certainly our planet is too big to fail. Certainly our children are too big to fail. And certainly every living species on this green earth are all too big to fail. Let's realign our priorities. Let's bail out the planet with central bank money. The way we can make that happen is by introducing the newest technologies as fast and quickly as possible. We need to pay for them somehow. We can bail out the planet with central bank money and create new green jobs, green infra infrastructure, which is the way of the future. We need to bring sustainability, energy efficiency, into our models of society if we are to survive. The technology exists today to cost effectively replace all fossil fuel use everywhere with renewable energies, smart grid, and conservation. It is only the entrenched interests of corporations, their profits, their shareholders, and there are paid politicians that are getting in the way. I ask all of you to consider membership, joining the Green Party, and help turn things around. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Yitzhar Chansky. I'm an Israeli journalist and filmmaker, and I work for, used to work for the Real News Network that Dimitri has inserted an ad for, and I also encourage you to go watch them. I was their correspondent. Um, but I wanted to bring you back uh, 11 years. Um, 11 years ago, I was doing my undergrad at the University of Guelph. I had just gone through a massive political transformation. Um, as Robert has mentioned, I grew up in the settlements in the middle of the West Bank. Uh, I still live in a very Zionist uh, family, and I had just had my mind blown because I had just recognized the Palestinians are humans. 
And before I could even challenge my views on Zionism as a movement, uh, the BDS movement started to uh, make waves already back then in 2005. And I remember I was very lucky because on my campus we didn't have liberal Zionists, meaning people who believe that um, gay people have rights but Palestinians don't. Uh, we had hardcore pro-Israeli support and hardcore BDS support and that's it. And so when I started to question, I was very lucky because the, play, the natural place that I migrated to were people who were criti critical of Israel's policies and at the time it was still the second intifada um, and had just heard of the BDS movement. And so when I first read uh, the demands of the boycott movement, they seemed pretty benign to me and I immediately signed my name to it and I thought, okay, that's great. I mean, essentially what they're saying is they want equal rights for Palestinians in the West Bank, equal rights for Palestinians outside of the West Bank, and equal rights for Palestinians outside of Israel. So essentially, equal rights for Palestinians as there are Jews, uh, Jewish rights in Israel. At the time, it seemed kind of common sense to me. And then <laughs> I moved back to Israel. <laughs> and suddenly, supporting the boycott movement, first of all, when I moved back to Israel, supporting the boycott movement was unheard of because no one has ever heard of the boycott movement amongst Israelis. And as there were more and more and more Israelis and Jews and internationals uh, that were joining on, Suddenly, around 2013, uh, the media discovered the boycott movement. And with it, of course, the fascist politicians that we have in the parliament and uh, the parties that are explicitly uh, fundamentalist far right, um, that some people might call fascistic, but I'm just going to go with far right. And what happened was BDS became illegal. Um, so, first thing they did as a, not a very intelligent government is they said, we don't like that, what should we do? Kill it. So the only way that they uh, thought of suppressing BDS is by making it illegal. So what the only thing that that caused is that there was no organization that officially signed on to the BDS. But suddenly, all of the press, hearing that there's this thing that we're not allowed to talk about, started to talk about the thing, <laughs> to say that we are no longer allowed to talk about this thing, making the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement uh, a term that would became commonplace in every single kitchen in Israel, and suddenly all of the Israelis were talking about the BDS movement. So thank you very much, Israeli mainstream media. <laughs> Unfortunately, that wave of support led to uh, that wave of questioning. But sorry, fortunately, that wave of uh, questioning led to more and more and more support, and they realized that just making it illegal is not going to be enough. So what Netanyahu did is we have many ministry, ministries inside the Israeli uh, government that have n uh, no transparency budget and no transparency at all. Um, some sections of the housing ministry, some sections of the infrastructure ministry, and this magical thing called the Prime Minister's Office, which is an enormous ministry. And so what Netanyahu did was he gutted a lot of the intelligence agency out of the Israeli military's intelligence and migrated them to this building and gave them a, uh, uh, a budget of $170 million to track down BDS activists. That happened a year and a half ago, and since then, we now have three ministries in Israel that uh, all that their uh, security and intelligence agents do is go on Facebook and find out who your friends are and map out who you are and how you're interconnected and so on uh, in order to build the global terrorist media supporting network of grandmothers and college students who believe in human rights and equality for Palestinians. Um, the results, as you can manage, uh, imagine of that, is that uh, it is now illegal in Israel to support the boycott movement. It is now um, a matter of security uh, and, and cybersecurity for you as an individual. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why I still publicly uh, affirm that I support the BDS movement. I think it's very important that we do that. Um, and I would say that as a, as a leftist in Israel, I'm seeing the BDS support growing every year. Um, so I really think that since it's becoming impossible for us inside of Israel to, first of all, change much, um, but secondly, say much, uh, I think it's incredibly important that for those of you around the world who do, um, to do everything you can. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, in 2013, I released a film called On the Side of the Road, which is about the origins of the conflict and the ethnic cleansing of 1948. 
I was very lucky because I got to travel a lot with this film. I went all over Europe, I went all over North America, I went to South Africa, uh, I went uh, some places in the Middle East, and the film continues to be screened, and it's been screened in, in so many different countries, and everywhere I, be I went, I saw that there is a, an incredible support for BDS, and that was the biggest uh, encouragement. So you're not alone, um, and uh, if you do support the boycott movement, uh, you're doing the right thing, and if you want to read more about it, Google it, uh, or talk to Dimitri. Thanks. Uh, the obvious question is, and it's something that has been above uh, my mind since I heard the news about uh, May's stance on the yes, is what happened? Uh, I saw her twice in person speaking here. She was solidly behind the Palestinian people, behind the Palestinian movement. What happened for her to change her mind? I'm not surprised if that's the first question. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a very difficult question for me to answer, candidly, because uh, Elizabeth May has many fine qualities, and she's done tremendous work uh, for the Green Party. She's our only parliamentarian. She's, uh, she gained her seat in the most recent election. And she is the only leader of any of the parties in Parliament to openly acknowledge, and she did this on the convention floor, I was there, I heard, that all of the critique that you heard the supporters of this resolution today and at other times uh, articulate about Israel's human rights record, its egregious human rights record, is correct. She doesn't deny that at all. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to speak for her, but she said, uh, not, notwithstanding her acknowledgement of those egregious human rights violations. She doesn't believe that this tactic is going to be effective because uh, the, the people of Israel, the Jewish population of Israel feels, feels besieged and the boycott and divestment movement uh, sort of exacerbates that fear of isolation, uh, you know, the fears that have emerged out of the horrible human rights atrocities that the Jewish people have endured. Um, for my part, uh, I believe if we hear all of the voices in the Jewish community, we will understand that there is another constituency within the Jewish community that is deeply offended by the way in which the Palestinian people are being treated by the Israeli government. They say that the Israeli government does not speak on their behalf. They do not identify with the Israeli government. They feel that calling people who defend the Palestinian human rights uh, anti-Semites to be an affront to the, the millions of Jews who have suffered horrible persecution uh, because of their ethnicity and their religion. We need, to, uh, we need to continuously make our political leaders, including Elizabeth, whom I respect greatly, aware of those other voices. And if we do that, I think that hopefully, ultimately, we can persuade the leadership to come around. Thank you. I'll go to this floor. Um, so this gentleman right here. So promise to keep it short because I have to go look for batteries. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask the question that Dimitri said would be embarrassing. Um, and I'm thinking here of uh, a posting that appeared, uh, a writing that appeared on the website of Independent Jewish Voices on September 1st. Um, it's a very clever, cleverly put together little cartoon of a, a sort of stereotypical Canadian beaver. And, and the title is uh, BDS is, is as Canadian as maple syrup. And all, it, it consists very simply of the three demands of BDS and then of uh, quotations from uh, Canadian uh, official policy, which uh, unless IJB and I guess me too, are, are interpreting, are misinterpreting the, the official Canadian policy, actually uh, should, put a, should put Canadians into line with support for the human rights of Palestinians within Israel. And very definitely, uh, Canadian official policy calls for the, the right of return of Palestinian refugees under UN Resolution 194. Uh, so, so there's the embarrassing question. Um, I, I, I do understand the, the sort of political reasons for what may be an incremental process, and, and is that perhaps the plan? 
I, I just want to make sure. Could, could you just succinctly state your question? Because I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As, as an academic, I, yes. I probably. Um, That's okay. <laughs> as a lawyer, I am too. <laughs> You, you, you said that the, the question of why the BDS resolution put to the the Green Party didn't incorporate sort of the full dimensions of yes. BDS was one that you could only answer with embarrassment. And so I thought, well, I have to put that question to you. Why did I do that? Is that is that your, your question, basically? Yes, yeah. and I was giving the example of the the IGB. Sure. Yeah, uh, it's, it's you know, I, I, it's a fair question and. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat what I said earlier. Uh, although I believe that the support for BDS is something that is a matter of conscience and that we must all, if we believe in human rights, embrace the movement. Uh, I'm also cognizant of the political realities. Uh, and uh, I hate uh, incrementalism, frankly, especially in the day and age in which we now live. I don't think we can any longer afford incrementalism. But uh, one nonetheless has to be cognizant of the political realities. And if I had uh, put forward a resolution that was fully embracing all of the objectives and the tactics of the BDS movement, with which I wholeheartedly agree, uh, I think the chances of our succeeding at the end of the day would have been much less. So this is a good start, but it's just a start. We have a lot of work to do, even if we uphold this resolution, which at this moment, moment in time is incredibly in doubt. Hi, this is a question for Dimitri. Um, I'd be, as a member of the Green Party, I'd be very disillusioned if there were any erosion of it. But I had a question about the limitations. Um, uh, this uh, BDS is limited to the sectors that were, are affected, that would benefit um, the economy and the society from the occupation. Given the, the theft of land, the theft of water, and the theft of gas, and the use of, say, Gaza as for military testing, what sectors of the economy and society do not benefit from the occupation? Excellent question. It's amazing that I've been fighting this fight for months and no one's ever asked me question. Uh, well, let me give you a simple example. Uh, the Israeli human rights organization, Bezalem. I don't think they're profiting from the occupation, at least not intentionally. Their objective is to defeat the occupation. So that's at one end of the spectrum. I mean, there, there, there are many, uh, not enough at this stage, I think, because of the indoctrination of Israeli society. But there are many people within Israel who are fighting the occupation. And both inside and outside of Israel, members of the Jewish community, they're not profiting from the occupation in any meaningful sense of the word. They are opposed to it. So uh, now, where it becomes difficult is when you know, I give you an easy example, right? A human rights organization in Israel, and then you might have something like a university institution in Israel, some components of which are, you know, they have members of their faculty who are opposed to the occupation, and others who are supportive of the occupation. What do you do with that? Where they're sitting on occupied territory. Correct. There's that, that's a little bit of an easier case. Uh, I don't pretend that there are simple answers to your questions. There's a spectrum of organizations, corporations, individuals, and in some cases it's easy, some cases it's difficult, and in other cases it's very great. Uh, we'll have to work that out, we'll have to flesh it all out. A resolution in the Green Party is limited to a certain number of words, and you can't really get into that level of detail. But I think we're intelligent enough to apply, apply that principle in a humane and fair manner. I'd just like to, to speak to what the objectives of the Green Party and the policy are. Certainly you are correct if we are approaching it from the point of view of a Green Party government and what its policy will be. But there's a meta game going on here. Have you heard of the term blockbuster? Well, that's what applies here. We are breaking the taboo. Now we can talk about it in public without fearing retribution. By setting a base for this idea, we empower others to talk about it and we empower debate and other political parties as well.
I, when I first became aware of this, actually it was an email, I believe it came through from uh, IJB, I'm not sure, which uh, I saw as being the really big victory, which was that the Green Party had uh, named the JNF as a uh, racist organization and it called for the uh, elimination of the JNF's charitable uh, status in Canada, which for those of us in this room have been working, some of us much more than others, on trying to deny the JNF uh, a charitable status was a huge victory. Uh, what is the status of that uh, particular position? Has that been removed? Is that still the Green Party's uh, position? And if it is the position, uh, then what do you see as uh, coming out of that particular part of the resolution? Because uh, it's nowhere been mentioned so far here. Again, I, I, I can't give you a short answer, but I'm going to take a minute to explain. Um, so. Um, someone who once sat on the board of IGB, I don't think she is anymore, Corey Levine, brought forward a JNF resolution which explicitly called for the revocation of the JNF's charitable status. And as I think you're probably aware, the JNF owns 13% of the land in Israel, and uh, no one knows this better than Leo Terechansky, by the way, so if I get anything wrong, I'm sure she'll correct me. But it owns 13% of the land in Israel, and it explicitly discriminates against non Jews in the allocation of land. And the Israeli Attorney General himself, not the current one, but a prior Attorney General, opined that it was a discriminatory organization. There is no question that the JNF should not have charitable status in Canada. It is complicit in war crimes. So J Corey Levine, and she had to endure the most horrific attacks from the B'nai B'rith and. Uh, Vancouver Sun and so forth. She, she came forward with a resolution which called for the revocation of the status. Uh, that resolution received actually a higher level of support than mine did. In, I don't want to call it mine, it's not mine, uh, but uh, the BDS resolution. Uh, she got 60, that one got 61.5%. It should have, and by the way, uh, Elizabeth May sponsored that resolution. Um, but um, Elizabeth May decided before the convention that she could no longer support that particular resolution in the form in which it was uh, uh, articulated. And so on the convention floor, uh, someone brought forward a, an alternative resolution which makes no reference whatsoever to the JNF. It simply states, uh, you know, organizations that are complicit in human rights violations shouldn't have charitable status in Canada. Uh, which is basically just a repetition of the law. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we viewed that as a, as a defeat. However, uh, to her credit, Elizabeth May on the convention floor said that she would send a letter to Revenue Canada asking them to investigate the charitable status of the JNF. Now this is where things get tricky. <laughs> now what has happened because they called this meeting in December and the express purpose of the meeting is to revisit any resolutions with respect to which there was no consensus, and there was no doubt that there was no consensus within the JNF resolution. The JNF resolution is now reopened, in theory, and we can go back and we, we can re, we can have that debate over again, and hopefully we will be able to fix it because it got got it, frankly, at the uh, at the convention. I would also like to mention that I read a CBC article stating that certain Canada Revenue Agency officials expressed serious concerns to their, to their superiors uh, questioning the validity of the charitable status. So the issue has moved up the food chain uh, in governance and in my opinion that there has been a political decision made to allow the JNF to retain its charitable status. While I can't prove this, there is some evidence to, towards that opinion. And if anyone would like me to forward any links, I'd be pleased to talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Okay, um, if I could have a point of privilege. Um, could you, just because you brought it up, could you be a little bit more specific about this consensus question, these procedural points. I mean, as a lawyer, what is the basis for contesting? Is there really any basis other than 
fear and politics. Is there, is there a procedural question here? Because I don't see any. Thank you for asking that, Robert, because I should have addressed that. Uh, there is no basis to question the validity of this resolution. Uh, and in fact, uh, the leader of the party is not doing that. This is now uh, acknowledged by the leader of our party to be validly adopted uh, policy. The onus is now upon those who want to modify it or to rescind it altogether to bring forward a resolution that will be adopted by the membership. The rules according to which that debate will be conducted are those of the Green Party. You can go onto our website and see them. Uh, the rules actually don't explicitly refer to consensus, but they clearly, and you, it's in, for those of you who are really interested, it's Article 3 of the Rules of Procedure of the Green Party on the website. You can see that the way the rules are structured, they are designed to maximize the chance that there will be a consensus achieved. But at the very end of those of Article 3, it says, if you can't get consensus, it has to go to a vote, and uh, you need 60% to adopt a resolution that does not achieve consensus. So what that means is, in Calgary, those who want to rescind or modify this resolution will need to get 60% support if we're going to apply the green rules. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, this whole consensus thing, I mean, we have to bear in mind, and this is something, we're getting into the intricacies of what happened at the convention, but we actually made a decision as the members at the very outset of the convention to adopt Robert's rules. Uh, and Elizabeth May did express some concerns about that initially, but on the convention floor, she ended up voting for the application of Robert's rules. And uh, as I've said to many members of our party, that was an entirely constitutional decision. We have the constitutional right as members to depart from those rules. And when I went to the convention, I must tell you, I never even heard of Robert's rules before. Like, it didn't confer any advantage on me. I didn't know what they were. I was actually cramming at 3 in the morning before the workshop to try to figure out what the hell are Robert's rules. Uh, and so that decision was made by others. We applied the rules. We, was, we got a, a, a decisive victory. This is now a valid policy. The onus now lies upon those who want to rescind or modify this resolution to secure 60% support the members for doing that. I would like to say that I have registered my concerns to the Green Party of Canada Council regarding whether or not we really need a general meeting. Many members spent hundreds of dollars and considerable amount of time to ratify policy and it strikes me unfair that their decisions can just be washed away so quickly. It's rather unprecedented that we have a general meeting to rescind ratified party policy just shortly after. And I'm wondering, what, what's the onus on this? Like, what, what is the justification? And I call on, on Green Party Communications Chiefs, Party Brass, to, to clearly articulate that to the members. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, just a few words. Uh, thank you, Dimitri and Constantine, for your efforts and for your defending uh, the Palestinian human rights. Uh, like as a Canadian, as a Palestinian activist, I really admit that the resolution meet the minimum that I can expect for the BDS. Still, it's a victory, a victory for the BDS. In, uh, in Toronto. Now, for the moment, the convention is coming soon, in December. And uh, this convention mainly will revisit this resolution. And we have to make it like very clear that we have to gain and to be able to re-adopt this resolution in the convention. Because any setback, any failure for this resolution, it will be a very big setback for the BDS in Toronto and for all of us as activists who are working day by day, hour by hour, to uh, defend the human rights of the Palestinians. So I really appreciate and ask everyone here to reach out to everyone in our community to support and uh, try to join as much as possible of our community members, the Green Party, so we can defeat 
any failure for this resolution on the ground in Calgary in December 3rd and 4th. Thank you. I would like to say something in response. Thank you for that expression of support. It means a great deal to uh, Constantine and me and the other supporters of the resolution. Um, but as we've seen, and Leo touched upon this, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the community of organizations that are defending the conduct of the Israeli government have a remarkable ability to shoot themselves in the foot. For example, the people who were standing outside today in a clown like manner shouting on their. Uh, the bullhorn, they've gone apparently. Uh, they, they draw attention. They draw attention to the cause. And in a strange way, we've been handed a glorious opportunity. And the glorious opportunity is the, the grassroots rising up and adopting this resolution are now being called upon again in the face of quite vehement opposition to sustain this victory. And if we can do that, I actually believe that that will send an earthquake a tremor, if not an earthquake, through the political class in this country and the mainstream media. That will be something that they simply will not be able to fit into there. It'll be a circle they're going to try to fit into the square of their propagandistic thinking. We have a glorious opportunity here. I would like to we add to that. This. What I would like to add is that we need some debate around this issue. When I was a candidate, there was a debate sponsored by Benai Brith. At the end of it, it was the president or another party official that said that Benai Brith needed to, quote, educate it with reference to the Green Party. So this is an open call to Benai Brith, Benai Brith or even Jewish Defense League for that matter, to have a formal debate where we can discuss the issues openly, where we can each have equal time to put our questions and answers together. So if you really believe what you're saying, the, the opponents of BDS, then please join us for a civilized and open, transparent debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the Green Party process. Uh, the slide that you flashed by, I think, said that only people who are visibly present in Calgary will be eligible to vote on. And if that is so, uh, what is going to be the role of, of those who join the party in the next uh, month or so in, in dealing with this issue? Secondly, uh, why isn't this an official Green Party town hall? What kind of consultation process is the party taking on this and other questions? And, and uh, what is the role of are, are the riding associations of the Green Party getting involved and, and uh, having meetings and, and expressing their opinions? Thank you. Um, in terms of writing associations, uh, I can tell you the two writing associations were uh, discontinued by people who were very upset with this resolution. Um, beyond that, I'm not aware of a formal organizing or debate taking place at the level of writing associations. I'm sure that there are many writing associations that are talking about this. But I'm just not aware of any organized effort to uh, uh, to address the resolution. That may change as, as this progresses, and we may find writing associations becoming involved in a formal way, and I hope they do. Uh, I invite any and all writing associations to uh, engage us in a dialogue about this resolution. I think that that can only uh, help to educate the public about the need for BDS and the plight of the Palestinian people. Uh, why the Green Party does not officially sanction this event uh, I think that's a perfectly good question. Uh, I think it's fundamentally that there are people within the leadership who view this as not being a done deal, even though they recognize that the, the motion was validly adopted. There is a meeting that is pending. Uh, and until such time as this becomes, it survives that further hurdle, uh, I don't think we can expect the leadership of the party to sanction events such as these. Uh, and finally, the first question you asked was about, you know, what role can people play if they become members, uh, but they can't get, I, I don't think you said this, but I think you were hinting at this, they can't get to Calgary. And honestly, people out in this part of the woods, uh, well, I've, I've made a request that, uh, well, this wouldn't be addressed to those persons, but people who were at the convention in Ottawa uh, should be permitted to participate electronically in the, in the 
the vending calorie because they've already incurred expenses as Constantine said to attend that convention. I don't know what's going to happen with that request. People who weren't at the convention in Ottawa uh, who can't make it to Calgary, they can play a role in the ratification vote. There's going to be a ratification vote afterwards, assuming that something survives, something comes out of that meeting in December, which amounts to a modification or a rescinding of the BDS resolution, it would have to be ratified. And the ratification uh, will take place online, as I understand it, and it will be open to all members of the, of the Green Party to participate in that vote. That's the last line of defense. If I put it to you that way. Yes? Okay, I, I'm just going to, it, just a point of clarification, is there a pre-December role for people who join, or is it just post? There should be, you know, this is, frankly, this is being done with so much haste that it's very unclear how this is all going to play out. But there should be a deadline, and I understand that there will be a deadline announced to the members in the next week or two, by which resolutions must be submitted for consideration at the convention. After that is done, after that deadline is passed, there should be an online vote, uh, which is sort of a preliminary assessment by the membership of those resolutions, as was done in this case. And as I said, in June, there was an online vote before the convention, where 58.5% voted in favor of the DDS resolution, only 13.3% voted against. So there should be an online vote, but that online vote is not dispositive. It just sort of says, where is that resolution going to go? Is it going to go to workshop, or is it going to go directly to the plenary? Uh, then there's the, the workshop of the plenary, where modifications are discussed. Then there's the plenary vote itself, and afterwards, the ratification vote. So there are many stages at which people who are members, or who become members in the very near future, could play a role. So and the other question is, in December, the December meeting, is every resolution going to be called into question only this one? The, what the Federal Council has said is all resolutions with respect to which the consensus was not achieved. And how many was that? <laughs> all of them, was it? One could make that argument. Right. Uh, but I'm sure that some people will say, well, no, there was general agreement on these few resolutions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dimitri. Um, Sharon Danley, uh, candidate of record for Spadina Fort York. Um, the thing I'm concerned about is how the transparency is going to be on, on the ratification. And will any other or new resolutions be allowed at that convention, are you aware? Related to the BDS issue? Uh, uh, no, separate. Separate yeah. resolution. Again, that's a very good question, Sharon. And by the way, Sharon is a co-sponsor of the BDS resolution, a uh, passionate advocate. <laughs> I think, look, you know, again, this is being done with some haste, so these are very important questions that have yet to be resolved. I, I don't believe that uh, they're going to be throwing open this meeting to any policy resolution uh, that one might want to bring forward. Uh, for example, if one wanted to bring forward a resolution like the one Constantine described, its excellent Green Marshall Plan resolution, I don't think that that's going to be within the parameters of what they envision here. I think they're going to try to limit it somehow to the resolutions with respect to which, or the subject matter of the resolutions with respect to which consensus was not achieved. So that certainly isn't going to be just the JNF and the BDS resolutions. There are going to be others that are coming here, coming into that category. I we, get, we get into really messy questions about what is a proper resolution for this convention or isn't. I hope we have enough time to discuss the various resolutions. I noted that in the last general meeting, out of three days, only two and a half hours was dedicated to the plenary. Now, in the next general meeting, there will be some discussion about electoral reform. Hopefully, that will not take up so much time that people will be cut off from speaking at the microphone and to the point where we can't get business done. And I will be lobbying actively to make sure we have enough time to do our business. Thank you. Um, as a point of interest, can I ask how many people here are actually members of the Green Party? Could you put up your hands? <laughs> how many, so it looks like about 25, so that's about a quarter of the people are already members. And how many people are candidates for the Green Party? Or were candidates? Former candidates, present candidates, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I did vote for the Green Party, eventually. <laughs> <laughs>
First of all, just a quick comment. Linda McQuee in the Toronto Star did write an article suggesting that Elizabeth May rethink her position uh, against the media, uh, against uh, the resolution. So there was some media support there, and I did write her and thank her. Uh, this is less uh, concerned with the technicalities of the, of the Green Party resolution uh, matter. I have always been concerned about this issue since the 1990s, and at that time I was very aware of it being a two-sided situation of the lives of the Jews who had suffered persecution for centuries, finding a home. Uh, now it has become a question that they are now in a position where uh, the rights of the Palestinians are completely overridden. So it has become less of a two-sided situation in terms of justice. And what concerns me, and I, I won't be long, is that the voice of the Palestinians in all of this is not heard. I have noted this since the 1990s. There are no marches on the street. There are very little to be seen in the media of the Palestinian people speaking for themselves. And so in terms of any liberation movement, I want to know uh, when that situation can be improved instead of others speaking for them, which I don't discount at all, but that they need to be there speaking for themselves and need to be included in all of these forums. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a word about Linda McQuay. I have tremendous respect for Linda McQuay, and you're absolutely right. She actually was the only person in the entire mainstream media who wrote a balanced, it wasn't a pro BDS art, it was actually just a balanced account. So I want to distinguish between Linda McQuay, and I'm sure there's some other fine journalists of Toronto Star who, apart from the editorial posture of the paper, well, I, what I was criticizing was the editorial posture of the paper. Uh, with respect to your uh, point, I think it's an excellent point. Uh, the, the Palestinian voices should be at the head of the pack. Um, but there's someone in this room I'm not going to identify her who's an excellent example of what happens when um, members of the Palestinian community come forward and who try to speak. Uh, they are subjected to the most uh, virulent vilification uh, and the more vulnerable they are, the more they are targeted. And unfortunately, the Canadian population is not yet as supportive as it should be of those voices. Uh, they, they're being marginalized and so people like myself and Constantine and Leah and so many other fine people, Sharon, we have to come forward and help speak on their behalf, but really we should be listening to the voices of the Palestinian community. They're out there, they're talking, but they're being marginalized and suppressed. Yeah, just that those of us who, have, who do speak up and have spoken up uh, run the risk of being bullied. I was attacked during my campaign and called anti-Semitic. We have real problems that way, and I've had a really difficult time online defending my right to defend the Palestinians. So I think what happens is people are afraid to speak because they get attacked and bullied. But the more we gather together, and the more voices we have, and the stronger we are together, the better we'll be able to push it back. I just add one quick point about that, about being bullied, etc. And I think that the liberal and conservative parties have some responsibility in creating such an atmosphere by launching condemnations in Parliament of those that support BDS, which is a non-violent, legitimate social resistance movement, and to condemn Canadian civil society for that is simply outrageous. Hi. Uh, I'll start with a question and then I will humbly, because I'm not a member of the party, make a few comments related to the question. 
So the question is, and it's related to what other people have said, um, what are the key educational strategies that you are going to try and implement to support this resolution supporting Palestinian human rights? My comments are that the way you presented, I'm talking about Dimitri, I think it was very eloquent the way you presented the issue in that you started with the human rights issue, not the intricacies of the resolution, Elizabeth May's leadership, all these other things which the media are picking up. And it would seem to me that that is the key thing to concentrate on. Unfortunately, most Canadians aren't aware of what most Palestinians are living through every single day. And they are not aware, it's related to the last question too, that to talk about this in Canada is to be smeared and vilified and we should be going on the offensive because it is a weak point of the pro-Israeli lobby that they are suppressing free speech. So if Elizabeth May, even if she refused to support this resolution, but could be encouraged to write an article that supported Palestinian human rights and said that all those that are criticizing anybody that supports this as anti-Semitic is intellectually bankrupt. That is what should be the main strategy and not all this other diversion. Uh, <laughs> this is actually is circulating on the, on the question of uh, free speech, she's completely in agreement with people like Constantine and myself and Sharon. She's circulating a petition uh, for the rescinding of that disgraceful resolution in Parliament, which sought to demonize the uh, supporters. So there's no, there's no daylight between Elizabeth May and the grassroots on that issue at all. Uh, the educational techniques we're going to employ are going to uh, be various. This town hall is certainly one of them, and this is the first of a series of town halls we're going to do across the country. Uh, we're going to go to Montreal. Uh, we're going to go to Vancouver, hopefully Victoria, Saskatoon, Winnipeg perhaps. Edmonton, Calgary. Edmonton is an excellent <laughs> choice. Calgary. Uh, I'd really love to go talk to the fine people of Guelph and Kitchener as well. I hope I have the opportunity to do that. I'm sure Constantine would as well. But it, it's, we can't just rely upon town halls. One of the things that I've been doing, I wrote that there was a, 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 a ridiculous op-ed in the Hamilton Spectator uh, I think I showed you guys the headline which said, you know, it was a bit, uh, the Green Party's big mistake. And that actually opened up an opportunity because the paper couldn't very well decline my uh, insistence that I be afforded an opportunity to respond. And so I wrote uh, an op-ed, which you can see, which does exactly what you recommended. It keeps the conversation on human rights. This is not about Elizabeth May's leadership. This is not about divisions in the Green Party. This is not about politics. This is about the human rights of the Palestinian people, and we have to stay on message. We cannot allow ourselves to be diverted from that message. I would like to further... <laughs> Touching upon strategy, I ask all of you in this room to send an email or a phone call to B'nai B'rith asking them to debate the other side of the question here. Instead of simply putting out slanders like anti-Semitism, Ask them to debate us. Every single one of you, if you send an email or make a telephone call, they will hear you. And besides the, the what would I would call more of a, a feeling or emotional argument uh, regarding the argument of anti-Semitism, there's a, another argument against it that's a little more straightforward and logical. That if any other nation did to Palestinians what Israel has done, then BDS would be just as viable, just as likely, 
and just as justifiable against any other nation. So BDS is not some special anti-Jewish or anti-Israel treatment. It is a universal. Thanks. Um, I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking a bit about social movements and sp uh, specifically about the role of solidarity. Um, as an Arab who's very active in the Palestinian cause, I spend a lot of time with Black Lives Matter. I do a lot on LGB, I don't know more. And so, you know, when we get together in those groups, I see so much power as oppressed people coming together. And so I'm wondering, has the Green Party tapped into that potential? So it's not just because it isn't just an Arab-Palestinian, Palestinian and Israel issue, it's really a human rights issue. And so a lot of the groups who are passionate about, you know, their own justice can really come into this issue. And, you know, have you looked at that? Has that been a part of your work? I'm curious. Uh, you know, these are the finest questions I've gotten in six months. <laughs> that's, really, that, that's really a very, and you, you, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to say something I wanted to say tonight. Uh, there's a, uh, the, the, the most vociferous opposition to this resolution has come sadly, regrettably, inexplicably from the DC Green Party. Uh, Andrew Weaver has said that we have violated the values of the Green Party. He's the leader of the Green Party in DC. He has a seat in the legislature and he's a climate scientist. He's done wonderful work in terms of fighting the climate crisis. But on this issue, he is uh, horribly wrong. And he's been very critical. And his deputy leader is a gentleman by the name of Adam Olson, uh, who is a member of the indigenous community. And he said, he's written a blog, you can see it on his, uh, his, his website, that uh, he feels that we are, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that we are disregarding and neglecting the plight of the indigenous peoples in this country. Uh, and that we should take care of the indigenous peoples of this country first, and then take care of people like the Palestinians. That is not a view that is common in the indigenous community. Uh, first of all, let me tell you about uh, an experience I had at the World Social Forum a couple of weeks ago. I went to watch a, a presentation on BDS, and Omar Barbuti participated by Skype, because of course he can't leave Israel without being prevented from coming back into the country, his country. Uh, and Ali Abumana, the chief editor and founder of Electronic Intifada, was there. And Ali said, without being prompted, he said, the way that we will succeed, we, the Palestinians, is to unite with the indigenous peoples across this world. This is a global struggle. We must come together. And then two days later, I saw a, a report about Marama Davidson, who's an indigenous member of the uh, New Zealand Green Party, who uh, is going to be on the women's vote to Gaza. And she says, I stand with the women of Gaza. There's a gentleman by the name of Robert Lovelace, who's an important member of the indigenous community, and he called, he called Gaza the largest Indian reservation on the planet. This is a universal struggle. It is a global struggle, and I reject unequivocally the sentiments of uh, people like Adam Olson. Uh, I'm sure he's got many fine qualities, but on this issue he's terribly wrong, and he should not be drawing the distinction between the rights and interests of Canadian indigenous peoples and the Palestinians. He should be seeing that this is a matter of common cause. Further, Andrew Weaver made a statement in writing which has since been withdrawn from British Columbia Green Party website. And it included the notion that even considering BDS at a convention was somehow against green values. <laughs> to me, that's absolutely incomprehensible. And I wonder what the motivation is for the leader of the BC Greens to come to some sort of opinion like that. And I ask for a public debate with Mr. Weaver, either between Dimitri Lascaris, uh, someone else that's supportive in, in British Columbia, BC Green, but let's debate this issue. Mr. Weaver, Mr. Weaver, if you really believe what you say, open up this issue to a public debate and defend your notion that it's against green values to even talk about BDS at our conventions. Thank you. Just a 
point of information, CRH Corporation used to own 20% of the cement industry in Israel. They've now divested themselves of that. I'm sure it wasn't all to do with the bottom line. So that's a piece of useful information. They're number three in the world in building materials. For example, they own St. Lawrence Cement. So the divestment movement is making progress. Secondly, you've done a good day's work. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, you're being talked about. BDS is being talked about. That's much better than not being talked about. <laughs> Finally, I see it analogous to the anti-apartheid movement in Britain and Ireland. It was very often the first step for young people to get into politics, progressive politics, was to join the anti-apartheid movement. So well done, and I think I'll even join the Green Party. <laughs> As, uh, I want to thank you for your resolutions and the struggle you've been doing as someone who has, I'm no fan of electoral politics, so I, do, I doubt I'll join the party, but I support you. Um, but I wanted to ask you why you would want to debate B'nai B'rith. I think we should be more strategic. Liberal Zionists are having a real debate with themselves. They're feeling bad these days. That's who you should be debating, because we want to build stronger movements. So we want to make those connections. And I have one question. I'm wondering, what do you think about the attack on the movement for black lives for two little lines in their very long statement about what they want, just because they deign to call what's happening in Palestine genocide, and also that they support Palestinian rights? It's interesting, you know, Elon Papi, an Israeli historian says that Israel's policy towards Gaza is an incremental genocide. So, why anybody would find that offensive coming out of the mouth of a Black Lives Matter advocate, uh, but not out of the mouth of Elon Papi, is a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, that said, uh, you know the Black Lives Matter movement is one uh, which for which I have a great deal of sympathy and uh, compassion, and I'm absolutely committed to the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that uh, their support for BDS speaks volumes. It's exactly uh, the point that I would make to people like Adam Olson. The Black Lives Matter movement has stood up for uh, the Palestinian people and for their human rights. This is a global struggle. As to debating, there's a saying that truth comes from the clash of opposing ideas. And that's what debate is all about. If there is an ideological opposite in politics, that is influencing media and influencing groups of people, those are the people that we want to call out. They are afraid to debate us. And we, the Green Party, calling them out, underscore that fear. I am fairly certain that they will decline. And if they accept, then from an intellectual standpoint, Greens will tear apart and dissect their positions. I just want to add one thing about the debate, which uh, some factual background. Science will debate you like. That's probably true. Uh, the the leader of the JNF was actually invited to speak uh, at the convention, uh, as was Tyler Levitan of Independent Jewish Voices, and uh, I think it was about ten days before the convention. All of a sudden, with no warning to the party leadership, an op-ed from this person appeared, his name is Josh Cooper, I believe, appeared in the National Post, and in it he said, how dare the you know, Green Party invite me to have this discussion on Saturday. Uh, as a Jew, I can't participate. So, as it happened, the Real News Network, uh, this is not known publicly, it's the first time I've mentioned this, and I'm happy to tell you all, the Real News Network invited Mr. Cooper to debate Mr. Levitan on the Real News on a day that was not. And, and of course, Mr. Cooper declined the invitation. The reality is they're never going to accept these invitations, but offering these invitations to the likes of Josh Cooper and Michael Moss and the Benet Brit, I think, really reveal their fear of open and honest discussion about the issue. So I, I do agree, however, that if I had to choose between debating one of them and debating a liberal Zionist, I would prefer to debate a liberal Zionist. Because some, liberal Zionism is a, is a much more uh, difficult argument to dismantle. It, it certainly uh, is not consistent with human rights, liberal Zionism, in my view. 
Uh, but it's a, a, a more difficult argument to dismantle, and I would invite that discussion. Absolutely. Hello. Um, it seems like December 3rd, there is a line in the Senate has been drawn on December 3rd. Can you think us through two scenarios? What's going to happen after December 3rd? So do you suspect that it's going to be a mass resignation of the leadership if it goes one way or the other? Uh, I can only tell you what uh, what has been said publicly, and uh, you know Elizabeth May uh, said on Howard Politics two days after the convention that she was devastated and was thinking about resigning as a result of this, and that she needed to reflect. And she went uh, on vacation. She reflected. She came back. She announced she was staying uh, on as leader of the Green Party, and that there would be a revisiting of the resolutions. And she was asked by the media on two or three occasions. Uh, what happens if this resolution is not modified or rescinded? And she uh, didn't uh, either exclude the possibility of resigning or say that she would resign. And that's all I know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether she'll ultimately stay or not. It's a possibility to be perfectly candid with the, you know, the Green Party. I want to be here clear about this. She could resign. It is possible if this does not succeed. Will you resign? Would I resign yeah. if the resolution is gutted? Yeah. No, no, no. I could, not, I could not remain a member of Shadow Cabinet in good conscience if the resolution is gutted. I would resign. I understand that um, Elizabeth Bay is, has said that she will do what her constituents want. And I read a letter, I don't know how many other people read the letter from her EDA. They all asked her to stay on as leader. That, that was very, very important. Did you see that letter, Dimitri? And so, and it didn't really talk about this too much, but they really want some their uh, leader to be the leader of can, um, the Green Party. So if that's their stance, then, and she says she will do what they want, then she will stay. And I hope that that's what will happen. I hope that Elizabeth will remain our party's leader if this resolution is preserved or substantially preserved, and that uh, you know we will take the time to calmly reflect between now and the next biannual convention. We have to have a convention every two years on you know how the Canadian public views this issue. I think by the time we get to the next convention, what we're going to realize is this is this is this is a tremendous win in the progressive community, which is the primary constituency of our party. You know, there was a poll done in 2014 by forum polling. It was three months before 551 children of Gaza were massacred. And so, if anything, support for Palestinians would have gone up, one would think, since that poll was conducted. And what it showed was that 67% uh, of Canadians did not lean one way or the other uh, as between Israel and the Palestinian people. And of those who did lean one way or the other, they were almost equally split. 17% were sympathetic to Israel, and 16% were sympathetic to the Palestinians, so within the margin of error. Now, who in Parliament is speaking for those 16% of Canadians? Nobody. They have no voice in Parliament at all. All of a sudden, we have given them a voice. And we only got less than 4% of the popular vote in the last election. Those 16% represent four times the popular vote that we had. So my perspective, and of course, within the 17% who favored Israel, there's a very, very high proportion of Harper Conservatives and people from the right wing of the Liberal Party. Those people are never going to vote for us. You know, they're not going to reward us for gutting this resolution. But the progressive community will reward us for sustaining this resolution. And I think by the time we get to the next final convention, we're going to realize that this was not just the right thing to do, but that it was a base-building exercise of mammoth proportions, really exactly where we should be headed as a party, into the progressive promised land where no one wants to go anymore in this country. <laughs> This is really setting up a bright flare to all the progressive community that's saying that the Green Party is willing to do politics differently. Um, I just want to 
say that I have known Elizabeth for a long time, way back when, but we discussed the Bank of Canada many times together. And I am really, of course, I'm disappointed. And of course, I'm thinking, is there any undue influence, which is what reporters usually think. I teach studies in propaganda at the University of Toronto. In other words, we analyze Hasbara. So that's what I do. The second thing I'd like to say is that this minimal, you have explained to us explicitly, and I agree, this is minimal. This thing that you're trying to pass is minimal. How much more can you modify it? I mean, what is going to happen? In a democracy, a consensus is not required. A majority is required. So I don't understand this long journey trying to get a consensus. Hardly ever in the history of democracy has any humanitarian law happened with a consensus because the people running things are never interested in humanity. So that's my question. Are you going to sacrifice this resolution to get a consensus? I have one thing to say. I to hope you. not. I, I cannot disagree with anything you said. I, I have absolute confidence that if this resolution had been defeated, that nobody who was opposed to the BDS resolution would be complaining about the absence of consensus. Okay? That is, let us be clear. It's time for the intellectual dishonesty to be shorn away and for us to confront the reality here. The complaint about the absence of consensus is entirely motivated by the fact that the BDS supporters won. That's why they're complaining about the absence of consensus. I have asked the Green Party directly for a copy of the text of the rules and procedure that they would like to implement. Still waiting for a response. Um, I just wanted to ask, or just make a couple of clarifications. Uh, so what Elizabeth May did say um, when she was asked how, whether or not she would resign if the second vote didn't go her way, essentially, is that she would not even possibly entertain the, such a hypothetical, as if it was not even in her, in her realm of possibilities. She even used the word realm, okay? So that's the way she, that's the way she answered. Also, um, before she uh, took, went on her vacation uh, to decide whether or not she was going to resign, on that very same interview that you referenced with the Rosemary Barton, she didn't say that. She she also said that she was about to take a vacation to, to ponder um, her her situation, but she also mentioned explicitly that she might resign just as a way to force the vote. Okay, um, so those are two different, very different things. Okay, one is a leader manipulating its own party. Um, and which, in my opinion, makes this, second, this supposed second vote completely illegitimate because you, you've used the threat of resignation as a way to manipulate your own party. People that want Elizabeth May for all these other reasons might vote against this, mo this motion the second time because you know, they're, they're worried about losing their beloved leader. And, and that's, that's a fair position, and I don't think that's fair for our leader to be doing that. Okay, sorry, I, I, I will ask a question. This is my question, okay? Um, my question is, and it's really just a reiteration of, the, of this lady's question back here, which, which was kind of put forward as a hypothetical, but specifically, um, you, you may mention that uh, uh, the, the Shadow Cabinet will be discussing which, you know, to, to try and figure out consensus within the Shadow Cabinet on how, how we can uh, revisit this uh, resolution, and you said that you might, Dimitri, you might, you might uh, have to make some compromises. Specifically, what compromises could you possibly make in this re resolution? I, I, it's, it doesn't go, like, it, like, like you even said, it doesn't go far enough. It's, it's not, it's a very minimal, I don't see any room for, for edit, or like, it, as I understand it, the, the resolution calls for a financial boycott of Israel of some kind. It's a yes or no question. There's no gray area. So specifically, how would you, how could you compromise on anything? Uh, uh, well, uh, it's, never, it's never wise to show off. So I will tell you one thing I would do. Whether I would do anything beyond that, I, I, I'm not 
you know, I'm not going to comment. Uh, one thing I would do is I would put an explicit statement into the resolution which says that we are not endorsing the BDS movement per se. It's perfectly legitimate. Reasonable people can disagree. But what we are doing, just to make it absolutely crystal clear, is we are endorsing the limited use of the tactic of BDS for a limited purpose. And our endorsement is not endorsement of the movement, although the movement's perfectly legitimate, or, you know, words to that effect. I, I could live with that. But you would specifically call for financial sanctions? You, you would not compromise on specifically okay. calling for financial I, sanctions I, I, on this was a I will tell you, what I'm going to tell you is not something I haven't said many times over to anybody who cares to listen to the Green Party. I will never agree to a resolution that does not call for meaningful sanctions on the state of Israel. And this Our government says, as I indicated earlier, uh, these are the settlements are a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. There's uh, the are an obstacle to peace. The UN Security Council, the UN General Assembly, countless human rights organizations have condemned Israel over and over again. We will accomplish absolutely nothing by adding one more condemnation to the mountain of condemnations that currently exist. It is time for human rights law to be enforced against the state of Israel. Right. They have to pay a penalty for running roughshod over the human rights of the Palestinian people. That is a red line that no one in our party should cross. Um, could you actually take advantage of the opportunity to make it a stronger resolution? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That theoretically is possible. Yes. Interesting idea, Leah. Yeah. I like that idea. <laughs> I'm actually a Filipino. I also visited Palestine last year for a two-week conference. Um, actually, I'm kind of scared because I've only been here for a few weeks, so I'm not at all familiar with Canadian politics. But um, since my visit last year, I was like, almost obsessed with, with the Palestine-Israel issue for many reasons. But I think primary, I think it's because um, you know Palestine is an issue that kind of connects all the dots. You know, when you think about these global structures of violence, colonialism, racism, everything, um, I think that's why we encounter so much opposition, not just, I'm sure, within the Green Party, but also within trade unions, among progressive movement, boom, movements that you would otherwise expect would support EPS. So I guess my, my kind of question is, um, um, are there efforts of, I mean, it can't just be the Green Party, you know, signing on to the EPS and, you know, just issuing statements and all of that. There has to be, as one, one of us mentioned, Kalina, is, uh, there has to be like um, a real movement, like working with unions, working with migrant workers, working with all of these different movements. It can't just be the Green Party speaking out. And then also my other question is, like, since I'm technically like a Filipino citizen, is it possible for me to join the Green Party and you know, vote? I don't think so, but are there other opportunities for me to participate in the Green you're not a citizen of Canada? No, I'm, I'm, I'm here for two years. I'm taking a geography master's program in New York University. I, I, yeah. I, I should know this, but I, I don't think you, you could. Yeah, I, 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 I doubt that. But, uh, I do agree that even if you can't join the Green Party or do not want to join the Green Party, okay, you must, if you care about human rights, support the BDS movement in any way, shape, or form. This is not, we didn't come here principally we wanted to, you know, explain what we've done here and help people to understand why it's important to defend this fight. But this isn't principally a recruitment exercise. Okay, so whether or not you want to be a member of our party, it's time for us to take a stand. And it is a it is a blot, a stain on the reputation of our nation that we embrace as one of our dearest friends on the international stage, the likes of Benjamin Netanyahu. He should be barred from entering our country. Not call one of our dear <laughs> I would encourage you to send an email to the Green Party to find out the rules of membership. Okay, um, I think you know we've had our three rounds. Do you need to say what you need yeah. to say? Okay. I mean, Faith <laughs> Attune is a very generous place with very understanding people who attend, so you'll be the last person. So saying that. The, this uh, resolution policy stays as is, and that there's a really good chance, therefore, Elizabeth May would step down. What a lot of people are afraid of is, is there somebody that could fill her shoes? 
Or is there two or three people that you know of? Yeah, so, <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, this has been stressful. Enough for me. <laughs> I, I just want to clarify one thing. I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it, there's a very good chance. I really have no idea what Elizabeth May would do. And I think she's, she's not really, I don't know whether she's decided what she would do. Uh, I, I only acknowledge it as a possibility. Right. Uh, if that happens, I have absolutely no doubt that there are people in our party who can step up to the plate. Yes. Okay. Good. That's the that's really a wonderful leader, and she has she can she can continue to be a wonderful leader. But there are wonderful people within this party. There are people in the shadow cabinet uh, that I'm privileged to know, and I would support them in a heartbeat to be the leader of this party if it became necessary. And hopefully that won't become necessary. And there are brilliant people outside of the party that could be recruited that share green values. And I am intending to open up a conversation. Um, I'm actually at the very beginning of at least one such conversation, but I can't reveal any names at this point. Perfect. So thank you very much. We, do you have a closing short statement that you wish to make? I, 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 I'm, I, it's been a privilege to be here, and uh, I, I, I'm really impressed by the quality of the questions. Thank you very much. It's actually spurred some thought on my own part and helped me to understand better what the concerns of the, the public are in Green Party membership, and I hope that we'll have many other opportunities to speak to the public uh, about this issue. Thank you. I think that this policy resolutions, these policy resolutions open up the eyes of the entire progressive community in Canada. Progressive communities have become disillusioned with statements like condemnations or BDS supporters amongst liberals and conservatives, and to some extent disenfranchised by the NDP's firing of candidates that have dared to be critical of Israel. So, you progressives, young people, we have an opening here to join the party, and with electoral reform, the Green Party memberships in Parliament, the representation in Parliament will only increase, and we look forward to those times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.